turn it over to a dear friend and colleague, um, uh, Dr. Ajay Nuka, um, who is uh, at the Winship uh, Cancer Institute at, at Emory in Atlanta and has really become a world leader in multiple myeloma. Uh, and um, Ajay, I've asked you to address the topic of when myeloma comes back. I hopefully made a case for good treatment up front, but unfortunately the disease comes back and I know you're going to walk us through that. And I'm just going to remind the audience as Dr. Nuka begins to please, I see they're starting to come in, but please uh, start entering your questions through the Q&A box. And when Dr. Nuka is finished, we'll take some time for the whole panel to join us and do questions before we take a little break. So at this point, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, uh, Ajay, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Joe, for the invitation. So I really like to extend my heartfelt thanks uh, and gratitude to you, uh, Brian, Susie, Diane, for bringing Empower to Atlanta, to bring the awareness of myeloma, which is very well needed, just as Brandon and you discussed very eloquently uh, prior. So what I'm asked to talk about today is, what do we do when myeloma comes back? So the first question that I start with is, why is it a question at the first place? So as you heard about the framework of multiple myeloma, Dr. Mikhail had made a, made a very good point of, you get the best duration of remission with your first treatment. Using the most optimal treatment upfront is going to get us into the deepest remission possible. And it would be, it should be a durable remission, which can be improved with all the maintenances which could be risk adapted. So at some point of time when the disease comes back, so what do we do? That is the question that I'm going to tackle today. So Myeloma is a disease where you, you see the relapse. And when you see that relapse or when the disease comes back, there are different terms that are used. Progression, relapse, disease coming back. These are all the same terms just to, for all of us to be on the same page. When you see these relapses happening, you use different sets of treatments. You use a good, and again, reiterating what Dr. Mikhail talked about earlier, Putting the best foot forward in myeloma has always resulted in the best long-term outcomes. So nothing to say for the later time, we always want to use the best drugs at each relapse because this is one of those diseases where the same treatment given at two different times, at the first relapse versus fourth relapse, you get two different outcomes. So it does not make any sense to preserve or save a drug for a later time. So now with that as, as, as a background, the response duration decreases with each line of therapy. So the first time when the disease comes back, you give the best treatment and the disease comes back three, four years later, you give the next, uh, the next best treatment that is available. The duration decreases with each of those, each of the relapses. So now what we want to emphasize is how to increase this response duration with each of these relapses because it is ultimately turning out to have a survival advantage. And this, uh, with that, I'll, I'll go to the next slide of how we define relapse and what are the various flavors of relapse. What you see on the right is not meant for you. That M spike of greater than 0.5 gram per deciliter, this is all meant for us to be on the same page of what clearly is needed to call a relapse. So what you see in the, in, in, in the left is probably what is more important to understand what, what is a relapse or what is a progression. So you heard about these terms again and again, M-spike, paraprotein, abnormal protein, abnormal antibodies, these are all the same. This is a measure for us to see how the myeloma is acting. Is the myeloma is in remission? You don't find any M spike. If, 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 there, if the myeloma is coming back, you see a small increase this is this M spike. So this is almost think about like think about it like a tumor marker which we follow to define a relapse or a progression. So now not all progressions need to be treated. So there are certain criteria. I'll, I'll focus more onto the under the progressions of the relapses that really need to be treated. That is the, down here, that is called the clinical relapse where the progression is associated with an end organ damage as defined by the CRAB criteria, high calcium levels, kidney failure, anemia, and bone lesions 
happening because of the progression, this is an area where we cannot wait. We, we need to jump on and start to treat aggressively ASAP. Next slide, please. So I put these in the, in the, in the simple context. Not every relapse needs to be treated with the same urgency. There are times where I see a, an abnormal protein at an M spike of 0.5 grams, and two years later it becomes one gram. And I'm watching this through the through the through the time. Understanding the relapse is is the key because those two years on that specific treatment, we want to squeeze out all the benefit that we could get from the currently current treatment that you're on. Just because there are new treatments that are existing there, just because you meet the criteria does not mean that you need to jump onto a new treatment. So what I do not like is a major reaction. You have a relapse. This is what we see. We need a change in the treatment. So next slide, please. So I'll put all these, how do we define these treatments into, into two buckets? The first one is what are the factors that we need to take into consideration before changing the changing the treatment. Next one is what are the options that we have? And we'll talk a little bit about the clinical trials as well. So what are the factors that, that we would use in choosing the next treatment? It is very important for us to understand what are the prior treatments. And I'll go into detail of why we need to understand the prior treatments. The next one is the patient related factors. Not every patient is the same. Some patients with heart failure, some patients are with kidney failure. We need to choose the right treatment that is really manageable for that specific patient. So that is what I meant by the patient-related factors. The third one is the disease-related related factors. You must have heard me say it again and again, not all myelomas are the same, and each of them have to be dealt very, very differently. And some of these need a more aggressive, urgent treatment, initiation of treatment than the others. Next slide, please. So looking closely at the prior treatments. So what is the information that I would gather from a prior treatment? So some patients tend to have a prolonged treatment. I'll give you, give you the example of the transplant. So transplants, we don't use the transplant at the time of a relapse as often, but if somebody had a transplant back in 2011 or 2010, and now they're relapsing, last week I proposed a transplant to them, not fully understanding that this, the, the benefit may not be for the next 10 years, but at least we could, we could get the next five years at a half the benefit of what we got, got from the first transplant. So those kinds of information would help us to understand the sensitivity of the specific disease to the prior treatments, right? So the same way, understanding what are the prior treatments that you did not tolerate well? What are the prior treatments that you're sensitive to? And what kind of a what kind of a status that you have in terms of the sensitivity or the refractiveness to the prior treatments. This is all very important for us to understand so that we understand the nature of the progression, understand prior treatments, what this, what this clone is very sensitive to and what this clone is not sensitive to as well. Next slide, please. So to summarize simply, one size does not fit all. Knowing about the prior treatments will help formulate the new plan because your phylum may be more sensitive to specific therapy. And more importantly, what we don't want is if you had a real toxicity to your prior treatment, we don't want to be using the same kind of a treatment. One example that I always give is the Velcade or Botasmab. You, you, you've heard, most of you have heard. If somebody has neuropathy, which, which is lasting for a long time, that is not the treatment that I would really want to use as the next line of treatment when the treatment is really needed. So this is very helpful for us to understand what prior treatments that you got and what are the toxicities that you had and what, are the, what is the response that you got to those specific treatments. Next slide, please. So the next factor is the patient factors. We talk about, I have patients in the clinic who are in their 40s, not probably as fit as some of them in, in their 70s. Not everybody is the same. We, we're all human. We do have different comorbidities, other health conditions that go along with us, performance status, comorbidities, and even the toxicity, the example that I gave with the neuropathy with the botasmib happening during the prior lines, all of these will help us to understand what is the best treatment to formulate. So patient factors is extremely important. If somebody has congestive heart failure using kyprolis or curfilzumab, which can accentuate that 
congestive heart failure may not be the right choice. So the patient factors are extremely important in understanding and making the right choice uh, for, for the, for the regimen. Next slide, please. So again, not every patient is the same. Age, other existing illnesses will allow for choosing or not choosing certain treatments. I saw a patient yesterday who came in with a subdural hematoma and he shared a history of a subdural hematoma. Now I'm making a choice of whether we should use lenalidomide in this patient. The, it, it, it is a little complex when, when, we, when I talk about individual patients, but if by using lenalidomide, if I'm increasing the risk of a thrombotic event or a clot and using the aspirin to prevent those clots, would I be increasing the risk of another, another subdural hematoma? That was a question that I was questioning myself. Like every single time when I see a patient, this is when I'm formulating a plan, everything goes in the, in, in the background. What are the, what are the risks that we're taking with that specific choice of the agent to what exactly is the benefits that, that the agent is allowing us to, to, to gain? And you make the det right determination based on all of these factors put together. Again, some treatments may not be safe for the patients. And the one thing that I always want to highlight is this is a dynamic scenario. There are at some point you may not be the right, that treatment may not be right for you. That does not mean that the treatment may not be right at a different time. So leaving the, having the conversation again and again, bringing those agents from the past where at that specific point where that treatment may not be appropriate, it does not mean as, as a blanket statement that that is not the right treatment down the line. And more importantly, the patient preferences. So if there's a patient coming from Tifton, I could have the best drugs with the best activity uh, against myeloma. But if, if, it is, if this is asking the patient to come here two times in a week, it is practically not possible. And choosing the right regimen, an oral regimen, which may not be the first choice, but it is allowing for them to come in here. All of those, again, fall into play when, when choosing the right regimen. Next slide, please. So disease-related factors. I'd like to spend some time here. There are some of these diseases, the high-risk disease, as Dr. Michal uh, alluded to before, is deletion 17P and translocations of 414, 1416s. And they present in, as an aggressive with the present very aggressively at the time of the presentation, they, they present aggressively at the time of the relapse. There is some urgency, there is some certainty in terms of what we needed to do right at the, right at the time. And this is a patient population, uh, even if there's a slight biochemical increase, my vigilance significantly increases and I want to treat as early as possible. So high tumor burden or any of those clinical relapses that we talked about, where the, the, the myeloma is presenting as a relapse, causing an organ damage like a renal failure. Those are the ones that we want to put out the fire right away so that we're back into the game in terms of trying to see what is the right option for you. So there is one genetic alteration. I don't know how many of you know about this. This is translocation 1114, where a piece of the chromosome 11 it has exchanged the genetic material with chromosome number 14. So this has a, a significance. So the significance is you, there is a new treatment that is not approved for myeloma, but, that's, but that is approved for lymphomas. And we use it as a off-label um, at this point of time for this specific patient population because they res respond extremely well. So the responses are close to 90% if you use specifically in this specific patient population. So if you do not know whether you have this genetic alteration or not, next time you visit your doctor, please ask and find out. And more importantly, this is in high prevalence in African-Americans compared to the Caucasians. Next slide, please. So again, summarizing myeloma is not a single disease. There's a lot of flavors and high-risk myelomas need to be dealt with aggressively with combination treatments and certain genetic alterations like the translocation 1114 will allow us to use different treatments. It is increasing an extra line of treatment or using another drug that we commonly don't use and that is allowing for us to gain some more PFS or survival advantage. Some treatments with urgent chemotherapy are necessary to put out the fire. So next slide, please. 
So here are all the available options, the class of drugs that we commonly deal with or the emits, the thalidomide, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, this, and PIs, the proteasome inhibitors, the bortezomib, carfilzomib, and exazomib, and antibodies you may have seen, daratumumab, isotuximab, these are the naked antibodies directed at CD38, and XPO inhibitors, these are the exporting inhibitors, selenexer, antibody drug conjugates called the belantamab, and the CAR-T is called the IDESOL, which was recently approved in May of 2020. Next slide, please. So these act very, very differently, and image bind to cerebellum, and they have direct action on the myeloma cells, as well as enhance the immune system to fight against myeloma. The three drugs that we talked about are thalidomide, lenalidomide, and palmalidomide. Next slide, please. This is the fourth agent. Now we are using a different name for this called the sermons. These are highly effective, more effective than lenalidomide and palmalidomide in not only binding to the cerebellum, also degrading at a much lower concentrations than what we normally need for palmalidomide and lenalidomide. More effective treatments coming down the line in the near future. Next slide, next slide please. These are the proteasome inhibitors. They act very differently. This is a hollow core. This is like a meat grinder that I always put it as. All the cellular proteins are dumped into this and they're broken down into amino acids. And this is very much essential for the life of a plasma cell. And now we are disrupting this machinery so that the cell raises a, a distress flag and the body's immune system is going to take care of the plasma cell. That's how these, these proteasome inhibitors work. And depending on where the, where the affinity for each of these proteasome inhibitors are, uh, the toxicities differ. So that's why you see very different toxicities for carfilzomib versus bortezomib. Next slide, please. This is daratumumab, a CD38 monoclonal antibody, and this acts in a, in a lot of immune ways to cause the myeloma cell death. This is a passive immunotherapy. Isatuximab also exactly works the same way, and glad that we have the availability of these monoclonal antibodies. Next slide, please. So among patients who, are, who had received the triple refractory disease, the survival outcomes are not as good, but when we, when we keep looking at the retrospective analysis, the median overall survival was close to a year among those patients that, have, that are refractory to a PI, a MED, and a CD38 monoclonal antibody. For those patients, the options that existing are exporting inhibitors as well as antibody drug conjugates. If you can go to the next two slides, please. Yeah. This is Selenexer. This is dropping up. Uh, blocking the export in and leading to a nuclear ret retention of these uh, tumor suppressor proteins that could help with the tumor control is what really helps with Selenexer. If you can jump to the next two slides. Great. So here are the CAR T cells. These act very, very uniquely. This is one Dr. Dr. Blue was mentioning about. The T cells are something that we all require in, in our body to perform that immune surveillance. So the T cells that, that are needed in me, Dr. Mikhail, everyone are helping us to prevent the infections, helping us to identify those occasional cancer cells that pop off and take care of them. So, which brings to the question, if there are T cells that are really doing the immune surveillance, why did I have myeloma? So the T cells probably are not recognizing the myeloma. So a simple process of taking those T cells by what is called leukophoresis and sending them to a manufacturer that can express a receptor, a synthetic receptor here in, in this case, the approved one is called the BCMA, which, which can recognize the myeloma cell and making an army of these CAR T cells outside the human body and introducing them to the, to the, uh, to the patient after giving a lymphodepletion therapy leads to a significant myeloma cell death. And this is the one that, is, uh, that has been approved by the FDA in May of 2021. Next slide, please. We have about one minute left, Ajay, Ajay just, just to give you, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of a rush here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Like, no worries, man. I'm almost done. Uh, if we can move to the next slide, this is the study that led to the approval of Karma. So belantamab works 
very differently in, 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 in terms of its activity. It is delivering a payload directly to the, to the target cell of, of the myeloma cell. And, and it has a unique activity, unique toxicity signal, but uh, the toxicity signal that we all talk about is the eye toxicity, but I've never seen anybody not recover their uh, uh, ocular functions back and never seen anybody ha uh, have permanent damage from this chemotherapy or the, from this ADC. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of options that we have at this point uh, that are FDA approved. And more importantly, what I'm going to focus is to talk about the available options that you can, you can avail if you're a proactive patient as part of a clinical trials and which are otherwise not available. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So there are several antimyeloma agents in the relapsed refractory myeloma space. So no one size fits all does not, uh, does not apply here. There are several factors that we take into consideration. Even though there are several approved FDA combinations as had been shown in the previous slides, the more proactive patient, I would say, always makes the best of the scenarios where there are effective agents in the pipeline and as a form of, of, of clinical trials. And by availing those opportunities earlier on, you're already ahead of the game. So at this point, I would conclude saying, when myeloma comes back, there is hope and promise. Don't panic. There's always an option and we'll, we'll make the best use of the situation. I'll stop there. Sorry, I ran, ran a little over, John. Thanks so much, uh, Ajay. It was a great talk, a lot of great information, uh, and we're getting lots of questions in. So I'll bring the whole panel up if you uh, can turn your cameras on panel uh, and just remind people that you can enter the question and Q&A. Uh, in the Q&A box, you can enter your questions. We'll, tr we'll cover some of the questions that are there now, uh, but we also do have time for uh, some questions at the end after uh, our next set of presentations after we have a quick break. So I'll just start with a couple of these and then I'll direct a few to each of you. Um, so quick questions, are myeloma patients cured in remission with MRD negative over two or five or 10 years or longer under your algorithm? So this is a great question. We didn't really get into something called MRD or minimal residual disease. This is where we can test the bone marrow for any tiny amount of myeloma that's left. And if we can't detect any, we call someone MRD negative. Uh, this question is really begging the notion of what is cure in myeloma. And we're a little hesitant to use the word cure, but if someone does, does get to MRD negativity and stays there for several years, we believe that's the path towards cure. Uh, we're just always cautious because we have unfortunately seen people whose disease can indeed come back. Um, here's a question, uh, Ajay, again, quick answer if you could. You know, you mentioned that with each relapse, unfortunately, the time in remission gets shorter. Well, a great question here, is there ever a time when the treatment that resulted in your remission of maybe even more than two years might be the best therapy after relapse? So is it possible for someone to get a longer remission after their first relapse? So that's a great question. In fact, what, what it is suggesting is the sensitivity of the drug to result in that remission for that specific duration. Absolutely would be my first choice. I'm fully understanding, number one, why did we stop the drug at two years? Is it because of toxicity? If this is because of toxicity, then I would want to understand why the toxicity. But in the absence of that, if it is a planned stopping and you have already remained in senior and complete remission by the time when, the, when it is stopped after a certain duration, probably, and if there are no contraindications at the time when you wanted to start down the line, 20 years down the line, absolutely the best way to go. Yeah, I, I think we're learning, right? That myeloma is a strange disease and sometimes certain drugs work really well in people. In general, the best treatments early on make the biggest difference. But we do sometimes see, especially with all these new fancy drugs you mentioned, we now sometimes see people get their best response later in the disease course with these new drugs. Uh, Sharice, if I could ask you this one, a uh, great question. What happens when you become allergic or, or have reactions and become intolerable? Are, are there no other options? Does this mean that uh, it's the end for people? 
Um, no, that's not the end. Um, you know, and it certainly happens. Um, I would not say that's real common, but we have to look at what are what are the type of reaction that a patient's having um, and where they are from a disease standpoint and what other options at that point or, or there is there something additional that we can give to kind of control that um, or just needing to go to something different. Um, don't see a lot of that with our actual myeloma treatments. Um, that I can think of really, I, I don't know about the rest of the panel, but you know, things sometimes with some of the additional supportive things we give, um, we can see a little bit more of that with things like immunoglobulin, like IVIG, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think when you know, people get a rash, for example, from an immunomodulatory drug or have an infusional reaction, more often than not, we can control it and keep people on treatment. I think that's, right. that's a really important lesson. Uh, uh, yep. Brandon, if I can ask you this question, you know, you were talking about other doctors being involved in other symptoms and so on. This is very interesting. When I was pregnant 31 years ago, I had protein in my urine. Could this have been an early sign of myeloma? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, that's an important um, kind of distinction. You know, um, all protein is not myeloma protein. Uh, I will say that. Um, so that's important to kind of recognize and understand. Um, honestly, and it's not even the most common, to be honest with you. There's a, a, a well-documented protein that is normal inside our body called albumin. It's not a cancerous issue, but it is something that does happen. So for example, if you take someone who has hypertension or high blood pressure, or someone who has diabetes, they can get protein in the urine. Someone who's pregnant can get protein in the urine, but it's typically this albumin or non-cancerous protein majority of the time. Could myeloma happen also? Sure. But if, if common things are being common, those things are much more likely to cause kidney damage just because they're so much more common. You know, you probably have met a person with diabetes. You may not have met someone, you know, this is a targeted group. So we call preaching to the choir. But before you may have had contact with myeloma, you may have never even heard of it. So some of those other things, blood pressure, diabetes, pregnancy can in themselves, especially in the minority community, a lot of minority women get something called what they call preeclampsia. So that does increase the risk of protein in the urine. So, so there could be a lot of other things. But for sure, the doctor's on their radar can also have that as what we call on the back burner. It will, it's not on the front burner, but it could be on the back. Yeah, we heard twice today about Brandon Blue's back burner. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm watching you. Um, that's great. We're going to take just about one more minute here. Um, uh, Ajay, here's a great question. Is there any of the research that shows that there are different considerations for African-Americans for frontline therapy uh, or <laughs> after relapse? Um, uh, uh, and and uh, Ajay, I'll get you to chime in there first. Uh, I may make a comment or two, and then we may have to head to our break. Absolutely. So we're learning more and more about this aspect. So why can't we have the, the real answer? More relative, to, more related to the, the lesser participation of African-Americans in the clinical trials. So none of these trials would allow for us to go back into seeing are African-Americans really getting the same kind of a benefit compared to the others. So now in the, in the more recent years, there was a study called the Griffin trial. The Griffin trial evaluated addition of daratumumab to RVD or the standard of care lenalidomide botoxymethasone versus RVD alone. So this trial we participated in and we probably have close to 30 to 35, 35 African-American patients among this, among this trial. But if you look at the RVD versus RVD in whites versus blacks, you're clearly seeing the stringent complete responses of close to 32% or 33%, which is what is exactly expected from this regimen. But when you see the addition of data to map has significantly increased the responses to close to 70% in African-Americans compared to 40, only 40% 40 in, in the Caucasians. So this is in no way saying that we potentially would get more responses for all African-Americans. What it is giving us is a signal that biologically with the immune therapies, there could be some differences that, that we, it needs to be further explored. So that is an ex example. The same thing applies to the car -Ts. The same thing applies to uses, usage of Revlimid. And there are several distinctions that we're able to see by the race. And these need large trials to be done specifically in these patient populations to understand or validate what the, what the initial observations are. Yeah, very well said. I mean, I think the take-home message here is that 
in general, we're seeing it time and time again, when African Americans are given the standard of care therapy, they're going to do better. Uh, and they ought to, they, they do also have more commonly, as we indicated, translocation 1114. So they may be more eligible, as you mentioned, for that drug venetoclax. Someone asked how it's classified. You know, it, it's, it's in a sort of a separate class in and of itself that we don't typically think it's not formally approved in myeloma, but most patients who have 1114 will, will have it approved. So many more great questions that we're not going to be able to get to. I'm going to answer one last one, and then we're going to go to the break. Um, it, it, one person asked, when is radiation needed for a myeloma patient? It's a great question, and that's always an individual case. We used to use more radiation. We typically save radiation now. Uh, if someone really has a, a lot of pain in an area where there's a collection of plasma cells that may not as easily be gotten to through chemotherapy, like inside a bone, where we focus radiation in a particular area, but it's not a, it's not a condition where as much before we used to use radiation before Brandon did transplant, we used to do radiation before transplant. We've learned not to do that as much now. There are a few more questions I could try and get to at the second Q&A, but I think it's time for us to stand up, walk around. A little timer is going to come up now. We'll take a five minute break, get up, move around, uh, get, get something to drink, another cup of coffee if you're out here in the West Coast, and then we will see you in five minutes. And I'm very excited about the second half of the uh, workshop. So thank you so much. <laughs> 